And now, it is my pleasure to bring up the senior pastor from First Community Church in Upper Arlington, Dr. Richard Wing. to that. 
as evidence. I begin my latest book, Debunking 9-11 Debunking, by saying the evidence that 9-11 was an inside job is overwhelming. That the only task is to get people to look at that evidence. Richard Falk said, if you will look at this evidence with even a 30% open mind, you will find it at least very disturbing. But many people do not have even a 30% open mind on this subject. Why not? What is so difficult? Well, there are many reasons why it's difficult to look at the truth about 9-11. But one of these is a type of faith. I will then suggest that Christian faith at its best opens us up. It allows us to look at the ugly truth of 9-11 without flinching. Now, of course, to look at this evidence doesn't require Christian faith. But I will argue that Christian faith or another kind of theocentric faith at least helps. And it helps partly by warning us against that other kind of faith that closes our minds to the evidence pointing to the truth. But unfortunately, for many Christians, their Christian faith does not predominate. This other faith dominates over their Christian faith. I'll talk about that a little later. But first, I want to suggest to you what I do believe to be the truth about 9-11. In simplest terms, it was a false flag operation. Uh, this is a term we're trying to get into the general vocabulary because it is most important. False flag operations literally originally meant uh, ships that would uh, wear the flag. And then sometimes they would run up the flag of the enemy and then go attack another country. Uh, and then that country would blame the country whose flag was on there, and we start a war between those two. Now, false flag operation means any kind of operation where you make the act, the attack, look like it was carried out by somebody whom it wasn't. And the purpose of this, of course, is then to have a pretext to attack that very group. So you attack yourself, plant evidence, as he used to attack the group that he wanted to attack already. Now these are very, very common things. All imperial powers have done this. When Germany was ready to attack Poland, which began World War II, they uh, uh, organized what has been called Operation Himmler. Uh, they sent German troops dressed as Poles across the border and then have them come back and attack their own border guards. And then they killed convicts, dressed them up as Polish soldiers, and left them there at the scene to prove that uh, Polish attackers had been uh, killed. Uh, when uh, Japan was ready to attack uh, Manchuria, and this began the Asian part of World War II, they uh, blew up their own railroad. This was called, it's known as the Mukden Incident and uh, then blamed the Chinese and used that as a pretext to start an attack that killed millions of Chinese. Uh, what about America? Would it do such a thing? We have many times. Um, many people know about uh, the Remember the Maine incident. It's still murky what happened, but it's very clear uh, the Spanish did not blow up the USS Maine. Uh, we lied about that to have a pretext to take over uh, Cuba. Um, then the other part of that war was in the Philippines, and now it has been revealed. Uh, uh, General MacArthur's father was involved in this, Arthur MacArthur, and he and others later admitted that they started the war and blamed the Philippines. And uh, the Philippines then became our first you know, really full-fledged uh, colony. Uh, and the, the, the very sad history of the Philippines uh, in this century, uh, in the 20th century and, and, and continuing, uh, started at that time. Um, then uh, Operation uh, uh, 
Celtics, Hump and Gold uh, was already mentioned. And most people realize now that that was a false flag operation. There was no attack on American ships by North Vietnamese. This was all fabricated. And it was that that led us full scale into Vietnam, which led to uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of American deaths, millions of Vietnamese deaths. Um, when we wanted to take over Mexico, out of Mexico, that's where I live in California, uh, this was due to uh, a false report saying that Mexico had attacked American soldiers on American soil when we were 200 miles over the border in, in their country. Uh, Abraham Lincoln blew the whistle on that. He was a young congressman at the time. But this is a sheer deceit, and yet uh, it, it uh, succeeded. Likewise, in, uh, more recently, um, after World War II, we were deathly afraid that several of the European countries were going to go communist. Because the communists and the socialists and the other leftists had been the real freedom fighters. They had been the real resistance to the Nazis. And particularly in Italy, France, and uh, Belgium. And so we arranged false flag operations there where right-wing militias uh, pulled off terrorist attacks. The most famous of these was Bologna uh, massacre at Bologna Railway that killed 80 people. Uh, now it has come out that all of these were organized under NATO supervision by uh, right-wing organizations. They planted evidence to make it look like communists and other leftists were involved because they wanted people to vote for the right, which promised to bring them security and to be afraid to vote for the uh, communists. All of this has been exposed in Daniel Ganser's uh, book, uh, NATO Secret Armies. I uh, uh, summarized that in the first chapter of my book, Christian Faith and the Truth Behind 9-11. Uh, first chapter is about history of false flag operations. <clears throat> So that's the general uh, context. What's the uh, evidence for that? Well, we could spend several hours on that. Uh, but I'll give you two examples. First of all, why were the planes, if they were hijacked by terrorists, not intercepted? We have standard operating procedures. These are rehearsed. They are very precise. They, 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 they operate very uh, fast. And so, Normally, if there's any sign that a plane is in trouble, it uh, permanently loses its uh, radio contact and its transponder, or, and or it goes radically off course. Um, the air traffic controller uh, pushes a button, very fast, just pushes a button, contacts the uh, nearest uh, military base, and uh, says, uh, or military, that part of the, the section, that part of the country, in this case it was NIAC, the northeast sector of, of NORAD, and says, uh, we've got a plane in trouble, can you send a couple of fighters up? They immediately call the nearest uh, military base that has fighters on alert, and this whole operation normally uh, takes less than 10 minutes. These fighters can go from, you can read this all over, go from scramble order to being out 29,000 feet in two and a half minutes intercepting within 10 minutes. And yet that morning, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes went by, nothing happened. Now, the story we were told first was that uh, this was because the FAA uh, didn't notify the military in time. They were very, very late. Um, so then the military put out its timeline on September 18, 2001, NORAD's uh, response time and showed when the military was notified and then when they scrambled their planes. Well, early members of the 9-11 Truth Movement did, did the math. And they said, well, even if the military was notified as late as you say they were, they still had time. They still could have at least intercepted the second flight and definitely the flight uh, that allegedly hit the Pentagon. And so what did the 9-11 Commission do when it put out its report in 2004? It told them a new story. It just changed the story radically and said, well, it wasn't that the FAA notified us late. It was that they notified the military not at all. So they didn't notify us about 
uh, Flight 175, Flight 77, Flight 93. And yet there are all these stories. There's all this testimony from all these generals and colonels. So of course the, the FAA notified us. But they just tell a brand new story, and then the press just tells a brand new story and says, well, that's why there was no stand down. The military didn't even know the planes were intercept, uh, hijacked, so how could they possibly uh, intercept them? With blaming the FAA, I mean, this would have been criminal dereliction of duty. Yet, not if we have no word that a single person at the FAA was fired or even reprimanded for doing a bad job that day. Doesn't that raise questions? So, the 9-11 Truth Movement tends to believe that what happened on 9-11 was a stand down that orders were given not to intercept the planes. We even seem to have eyewitness testimony to this. Secretary of Transportation, Norman Mineta, in open testimony, televised to the 9-11 Commission, was telling the story. Now, he was talking about something else. He didn't mean to be revealing this, but he didn't know what, probably what he was uh, revealing. But he said, I got down to the uh, underground bunker under the White House, technically known as PIOC, or the Presidential Emergency Operations Center. I got down there at 9.20 that morning. Dick Cheney was already there and in charge. And after I'm there a little bit, a young man comes in the room and says to the vice president, that plane is now 50 miles out. He comes back in pretty soon and says, Mr. Vice President, that plane is now 30 miles out. Comes back in in a few minutes and says, Mr. Vice President, that plane is now 10 miles out. Do the order still stand? And Cheney says, of course the order still stands. Have you heard anything different? Now, this was just before the Pentagon was struck. It sounds like that Mineta overheard a stand-down order. Now, Mineta said, oh, I assume the order was to shoot the plane down, but of course, whatever it was, was not shot down. And why would the young man been puzzled that the order still stands? I mean, this is the most restricted airspace in the world. Of course, any non-military plane going there should be shot down. So the story only makes sense if it was an order not to shoot it down. What did the 9-11 Commission do with that? It obliterated it from the record. You read the 9-11 Commission report, you will not read anything about Norman Mineta's statement. You go to the archives, listen to the video, the only part of the official record that was removed from the video is that Norman Mineta's story. You realize this is very, very sensitive. But they can't remove it altogether, they haven't yet. You can still watch it on YouTube. <laughs> so if you read my books, you'll find uh, where you can go to see that for yourself. Uh, what about hijackers on the plane? Don't we know there were hijackers on the plane? For all this evidence, there were hijackers on the plane. You start looking closely at all the evidence, it all disappears. Surely we know the first thing that we got word about hijackers was Barbara Olson's call, right? Barbara Olson. CNN commentator calls her husband, Ted Olson, who's the Solicitor General for the Department of uh, Justice, and tells him, uh, I'm on Flight 77, and uh, they're hijackers. They're armed with knives and box cutters. That's where you learned that there were box cutters. That's the only, only place that was ever said there were box cutters, our Olson's testimony. And uh, they heard it, it's all back to the back of the plane. All the passengers and the crew, including the captain and, uh, and the co-pilot. And uh, what should I do? And uh, Ted uh, told uh, CNN, he called CNN that afternoon, uh, reportedly, told him that, said that she called him twice. Now he was somewhat confused. First he said it was a cell phone, and the next he said it was an air phone, and then he said it was a cell phone, and then he said it was an air phone. But, uh, uh, the basic story was that uh, she had reported that there were hijackers on the plane. So that was one of the ways we learned that. But now, if you fast forward to 2006, the Masali trial, the so-called 20th hijacker, Zachariah Masali, um, the FBI presented evidence there about the phone calls from all the four planes. What does it say? 
about flight 77. When it gets to Bard Rolls, and it says, one attempted call, unconnected, zero seconds. Now this is astounding. Department of Justice, uh, the, the FBI is part of the Department of Justice. Ted Olson was the Solicitor General for the Department of Justice. Ted Olson almost got appointed uh, Attorney General here uh, last week. The FBI has now said that Ted Olson's story is not true. This should have been a screaming headline in all the newspapers in the country, and none of you had heard of it, right? No. What about Flight 93? Surely we know there were lots of cell phone calls from that flight. At least 10, the newspapers told us. Uh, three people said explicitly they knew they were cell phone phones because uh, two of them, the, the voice they heard uh, calling for their loved one from the plane said, I'm calling from a cell phone. And in one case, the most famous case, Adina Burnett, so she got four cell phone calls from her husband, Tom Burnett, and she knew that it was his cell phone because she saw the caller ID number. What did the FBI say about Flight 93? There were 35 air phone calls, two cell phone calls that occurred at 9.58, just before the plane crashed when the plane was down to 5,000 feet. Now, why is that significant? There had been a big dispute, the 9-11 truth movement, many members were arguing, cell phone calls from high altitude in airliners are impossible. And the defenders were saying, oh, no problem. Uh, of course it's possible. Bobby McCann, if you saw their show, 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, no problem. The same time they, in their 2006 book, were defending these calls, the FBI was undercutting them and said none of those so-called high-altitude phone calls uh, occurred. And that includes uh, Tom Burnett's four calls. So what do you make of that? <laughs> if you ask me during the Q&A, Q I'll tell you what I make of it. I'm not saying that Nina Burnett is lying. I'm, I'm saying she was duped. Um,
Lord. Uh, in uh, March and April and part of May of 2001. Hmm. So those stories kind of got cleaned up in the press. There was a there was a night, September 7th, when Otta and uh, one of his buddies went out drinking at a place called Shuckles in Miami. And uh, uh, the story was, it was in all the papers, a very popular story, very popular story, that they got really, really drunk. The bartender said they were wasted. Uh, Otto was drinking vodka and orange juice, uh, at least five big glasses of these. And uh, the story got changed by the time it got to the Los Angeles Times. Otto was drinking cranberry juice and playing a video game. Now, this was September 7th, just four nights before the attack, but that wasn't good enough for the 9 11 Commission. In spite of all these stories that were in the papers all around the world, they just said, on September 7th, Otto flew to Baltimore in order to uh, start planning the attacks. They get away with this. The press knows the September story. They told it dozens of times, and they never report that there's some contradiction between what they had reported that Otto was doing and uh, what uh, uh, the 9-11 Commission said. Um, how did they learn about the identity of the hijackers? You know this story? Very interesting. According to the, what you read on the very first page of uh, the 9-11 Commission report, Otto and one of the other hijackers, Al Amari, were in Boston on September 10th. They were already there, ready to get on flight 11. But strangely, they decided to rent a car, a Nissan, and drive it up to Portland, Maine, stay overnight in the Comfort Inn, and then get up early, get on a commuter flight back to Boston the next morning. Now this was very strange. They've been planning this operation for years. Otto is the ringleader. They're all dependent on word from him. If he hadn't made the flight, the whole thing would have had to have been scrapped. And at least my experience is commuter flights are sometimes late. Everybody knows this. The 9 11 Commission admits we don't have a clue as to why Otto went to Portland. But it turns out it was very good that he did because although he made the flight in plenty of time, his luggage didn't. And so after the attacks, they said, oh, package of Muhammad Otto, let's see what's in here. They look in there, and there's all this incriminating evidence that proves these people who were associated with Osama bin Laden were the hijackers. There were directions on how to fly an airplane. There were uh, uh, instructions to the other hijackers, you know, be faithful. Um, there was Otto's will, which of course you would take on a plane, you were going to fly into the Royal Trade Center. <laughs> and uh, most important, there were the names of all the hijackers. So the FBI said, well, that's how we got the names so quickly. It was in, it was in the, the suitcase. But why didn't the suitcase make the people say, well, it's because the plane just barely got there. No, it got there an hour ahead of time. So why didn't the luggage make the transfer? Another mystery. Well, if you go back to September 12th, you learn a completely different story. In the first days after the September 12th, 13th, and early 14th, they were telling a completely different story. Otto had driven a Mitsubishi, not a Nissan, a Mitsubishi, and he parked it in the airport at Boston Logan. And that's where they found the treasure trove of information. Portland, there was a couple of that guys named Bukhari. And they had gone up to Portland, stayed at the Comfort Inn, and then taken the commuter flight down. But then they discovered that the cars didn't die on 9 11. One of them had died the year before, and one of them was still alive. Well, they had this story about Portland, so somebody had to go to Portland, so they just changed the story. So, Muhammad Otto. So, even though the story makes no sense, why would he do that? Why would he like it? And, and can you imagine? that the FBI guy who found this treasure trove of information could have been confused. He said, well, gee, you know, the first three days, I was thinking I found all that stuff in the Mitsubishi at Logan, but actually now I remember, no, it was in the suitcase there inside me. So you know, this is just all made up. And they just do this with 
with every part of the story. Hani Hanjur flew Flight 77 into the Pentagon, right? You all know that? This flight was amazing. Comes in, and instead of just attacking the roof of the Pentagon, which was huge, many of these are easy to get. Uh, could have killed thousands of people. It does an amazing loop, 333 downward sp degree downward spiral, and then comes in at ground level and crashes into the first, between the first and second floor of the Pentagon without scraping the Pentagon grass. You look at the photos, there's not a mark on the Pentagon grass. Sure, honey could do this until you look, and even in the mainstream press, you have dozens of stories saying, this guy was a terrible pilot. He couldn't fly a little single engine Cessna. Flight instructors wouldn't go up with him a second time, saying, here's your dangers. <laughs> they wouldn't rent a plane to him. A story in the New York Times ended with an instructor saying, the guy couldn't fly at all. And yet, he was supposed to have done this, which members of Pilots for Truth Pilots for 9-11 Truth, there is such an organization. They say, many of them who were themselves big airline pilots, said, I don't think I could have done that. I know Honey Hunter could. So right there, that story alone, you know the official story is false. Well, what we know Osama bin Laden was behind it all, right? Well, Colin Powell, right after 9-11, promised a white paper proving this, and then backed out, said, well, the information is classified, so we can't reveal it. So Tony Blair stepped in and provided a paper, but he began with the statement, this does not purport to provide evidence that would stand up in a court of law. So it's good enough to go to war, it's not good enough to go to court. <laughs> what does the FBI say? If you go on the webpage for Osama bin Laden, most wanted terrorist, you find he's wanted for various terrorist attacks, but no mention of 9-11. No mention of 9-11. So a guy named Ed Haas, who has the Muck Record Report, you can go on Google, find that, um, called up Rex Toom of the FBI, chief of the investigative publicity, and said, why not? Toom said, well, he's not on there because the FBI has no hard evidence that Osama bin Laden was involved in 9-11. You haven't read that in your headlines? You're starting to get the picture if you didn't know it already. The news media are not telling the truth about 9-11. They're systematically covering up the most important evidence about 9-11. Let's go to the World Trade Center. It's Twin Tower. Uh, official story, they came down because the airplanes hit them, started big fires, and then the fires, plus the impact damage, brought the buildings down. Brought the buildings down in a way that uh, comes very close to what we call uh, the kind of uh, controlled demolition known as implosion, where the building falls in on itself. But it wasn't a classical implosion because the, 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 the tower, the collapse started from the top rather than the bottom. So many people say, well, it couldn't have been controlled demolition because all demolition, controlled demolition starts from the bottom. Well, it's not true. You can start it wherever you want to. You just put it on a computer and you, you have the explosions go off in the order that you want them to. And in this case, the story was going to be they came down because that's where the planes hit. So, of course, it had to start from the uh, bottom, uh, from the top. But what's the, what's the matter with this story? Well, so many things. Um, first of all, Buildings, uh, steel-framed high-rise buildings have never before collapsed for any other reason, suffered total collapse for any other reason than explosives being systematically placed throughout the building in the process of controlled demolition. Furthermore, at least 200 people have testified, and much of this is on video, uh, that explosions were going off in the towers. 
The fire department of New York did oral histories of the fire department. 503 people gave testimonies. 118 of them reported things that sounded, that made it, that appeared to be explosions going off of the building. Many of them are very dramatic. Many of them say it was floor by floor by floor, boom, 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 just like those controlled demolitions we have seen. Furthermore, the official story again, the only energy there is the impact of the airplane, fire, and then gravitation bringing bring the building down. Big sections of steel beams. Uh, these towers, you see, had uh, 287 steel beams that went all the way from the sub-basements to the roof. So there were 47 in the core of the building, and then 240 out around the outside. And these were welded together in sections. Some of these sections, the three or four beams, were blown out horizontally 400, 500 feet and plastered themselves in surrounding buildings. Does that sound like gravity to you? All the concrete in the buildings was pulverized into tiny dust particles. That in itself would have taken a tremendous amount of energy that was not available from fire and gravity. Furthermore, the buildings come down at virtually free fall speed. And so once the explosions occur, then they come down straight down into their own footprint. That means that those 247, uh, 287 beams, it was as if they weren't there. The top of the building was just coming down through the lower part of the building as if the lower part of the building wasn't there. And that's because it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, now, what about World Trade Center 7? Uh, they, tried to keep that, they tried to keep that a big secret. 9-11 Commission, in its report, did not even mention the Building 7 collapsed at 5.20 that afternoon. It was not hit by a plane. It did not have raging fires. By the time it collapsed, it had fires on uh, three, four, or five floors at the most in this 47-story building. Uh, it is a perfect simulation of a classical implosion. If you've seen it on TV, you see it comes straight down, perfectly still, and then it just goes straight down, 6.6 .6 seconds, almost free fall speed. Furthermore, now we have a testimony of people uh, who were in the building that explosions were going off there uh, actually quite early that morning. If you see Loose Change Final Cut, uh, you will see some of this. How much of that testimony is going to get in is still uh, uh, in doubt. I happen to have uh, know this because I'm the script consultant for Loose Change Final Cut. And uh, it's still up in the air whether this one uh, uh, dramatic testimony will be uh, uh, able to be uh, included. Experts look at this building and there's no doubt in their mind as controlled demolition. You can go on uh, YouTube or Google, I'm not sure, and uh, look for a uh, Dutch expert, uh, this guy named Danny Jowinkel, J-O-W-E-N-K-O. Um, I talk about this in the, the new book, uh, uh, Funky, 9-11 Funky. And uh, somebody, he, he didn't even know, that, he didn't know, even though he owns the demolition company, he didn't know the Building 7 had collapsed. He just thought the Twin Towers had. So this a journalist comes in and plays, says, I have something here I'd like you to look at. Tell me what it is. So he plays Building 7 coming down. The only guy looks at it and says, well, that's controlled demolition. So they've taken out the, the, the substructure, taken out those uh, beams, and then the building comes straight down, claps it down on itself. Are you sure? Absolutely, no question about it. That happened on September 11th. No. Yes. You sure? <laughs> yes. On September 11th? Yes. Then those boys worked very hard. Okay. That's a small sample of the kind of evidence that the 9-11 Truth Movement has been presenting over the past uh, several years. Now, I said, we have a certain kind of faith 
that have prevented many people uh, in America from seeing this truth, even looking at the evidence. And it, all, it definitely keeps this evidence from being presented on the mainstream media. We're not asking the mainstream media to endorse our theories. We're just saying, could you present the evidence that we have here and let people make up their own minds? No. Um, but what is this faith that is not simply blind faith, but blinding faith? It can be called American faith, faith in America. It's a form of nationalistic faith. As the Middle Ages broke up and Christendom started uh, uh, weakening, um, whereas Christian faith had been the common faith uh, in the Middle Ages, it was pretty soon replaced by nationalism, national faith, faith in your own country. Um, and this was particularly strong in America because uh, our forefathers build ourselves as the, build America as the exceptional nation. Sure, those European leaders, they were ruthless, they were lying, they were thieving, they were imperialistic, but Americans are different. We are the exceptional nation. Our leaders are virtuous. We grow up with this. Everybody grows up in a culture with a faith. Uh, and I'm using faith here just to mean the, the most general kind of vision of reality you have, the way the universe is. So if you grow up in a Buddhist country, you grow up with a different faith, a different perspective. Now, you get a certain age, you start criticizing, you may reject your inherited faith. So many people who grew up with American faith uh, came to reject it, particularly during Vietnam. They said, no, we're not always virtuous. We sometimes lie to go to war and kill people for no good reason other than we want to dominate them. And uh, so there's nothing permanent about American faith, but it tends to be uh, very self-sustaining. And it is the public story. It is the only story that can be told in the mass media. So mass media can reveal particular bad things that the government does. But you can't, the mass media cannot reveal something that would shake people's faith in the fundamental goodness of our country. So that's what I mean by American faith, American faith, a faith in America. <clears throat> so you know the, the story that, you know, Abu Ghraib, this wasn't systemic, this wasn't something ordered by the Pentagon, it was just a few bad apples, usually very low <laughs> down bad apples. The bad apples are never generals. Um, because our leaders simply wouldn't do anything that was truly evil. They make mistakes. Oh, they make lots of mistakes. They thought there were weapons of mass destruction over there. It wasn't that they lied deliberately, even though the Downing Street memo has told us that that was going to be the pretext for war. Now, the chief of British intelligence came back from America after meeting with Tennant and other leaders and says the Americans are determined to go to war in Iraq. Well, what's the pretext going to be? Weapons of mass destruction. How do they know they're going to get word that there's been weapons of mass destruction there? The intelligence is going to be fixed around the policy. Our newspapers wouldn't even reveal that for the first week or two. The New York Times finally, one of the bloggers finally forced you know, people to write enough letters uh, about on tw page 24, I think. So you got a story about this. I tell this story in my book, uh, Christian Faith and the Truth Behind 9-11. As part of my plea for a new uh, kind of media in this country, we need a media that is devoted to the truth. So what about if Christians, Jews, and Muslims, the three Abrahamic faiths, would say, let's form our own broadcasting network. We're not devoted to any nation to protecting its secrets, to lying on its behalf. We're going to tell the truth about what's going on in the world because our God 
is the God of truth. And we are supposed to speak the truth as we know it. Um, that's one of the illustrations of the Down the Street memo. And of course, 9 11 is the chief illustration of why we need uh, a new kind of uh, uh, news network. <clears throat> if any group then suggests that the American faith is false by trying to claim that something like 9 11 was an inside job, um, they suddenly are outside the acceptable boundaries of discourse. So we are not allowed in mainstream magazines or newspapers or television to tell our story. If we go on a television network, it's only to be ridiculed, to be pummeled. I was allowed on once on MSNBC, Tucker Carlson. And uh, he called me sinful. Not because of my Christology, but because I challenged the fundamental goodness of America by saying 9 11 was an inside job. This was the, only, this was the heresy that was unacceptable. Um, and once we understand this truth about the American faith as permeating uh, much of our culture and dominating the public discussion, what is allowed to be discussed in the public square, then we understand this word, this term that is used to dismiss those of us in the movement, conspiracy theorists, used ubiquitously. It's used in every single story to discredit anyone who suggests uh, something other than the official uh, conspiracy theory about 9-11. And at one level, this is public because um, a conspiracy is simply, you look in the dictionary, it's when two or more people agree in secret to do something illegal. Well, did you read your newspaper today? I bet you read about a new conspiracy. I mean, people conspired to rob banks. Corporations conspired to defraud their customers. Insurance companies certainly <laughs> conspired to defraud. The health of them, you know, we, we, we were saturated with conspiracies. And we believe a lot of those. Partly because a lot of them are true. So we're all conspiracy theorists. We believe dozens, hundreds of conspiracies have occurred. But the term is never used that way. It's only used uh, about uh, people who challenge something very fundamental. So if you look then, uh, if you look at this dispassionately, you say, well, that's very public. Why would they use this term in this very one-sided way since the official story uh, is a conspiracy? You know, the only question is, who are the conspirators? From the point of view of the official conspiracy theorists, who is Osama bin Laden and these 19 hijackers? From the view of the 9-11 truth movement, um, there, it was at least, at least involved, if it wasn't totally planned by, uh, people within our own uh, government. And so looking at it dispassionately, you would say, well, you know, we've got two theories here. This comes up in science all the time. We've got this theory and this theory. So you look at it and say, well, which one handles the evidence better? Why don't we do that here? Now, if you did that here, it would be case closed. It's just uh, very obvious that uh, uh, the official theory is false. Now, the way they use this, they say, well, of course, and eh, but when we say conspiracy theory in a derogatory sense, what we mean is an irrational, unscientific theory. And uh, Kenan Hamilton, the chair and co-chair of the 9 11 Commission, uh, put out a new book called uh, Without Precedent, The Inside Story of the 9 11 Commission. I devote the second chapter of debunking 9 11 debunking to it. And in that chapter, they very helpfully lay out several characteristics of what they mean by an irrational, conspiracy theory. It's one where you start with the theory rather than the facts, and then you construe the facts to fit the theory. You ignore all evidence that doesn't fit your theory. You use ideas that have already been disproven. And most of all, you have disdain for debate. Now I go through and I show that if that's what a disreputable conspiracy theory is, that's the official theory. It fits all of those characteristics to a T. Let's take disdain for a debate. 
No body representing the official story will debate any member of the 9-11 Truth Movement in a public forum. The same Ed Haas tried to organize a public television debate, a national debate on television. He invited members of the 9-11 Truth Movement, he invited members of NIST, <coughs> National Institute of Standards and Technology, who put out the official report on the towers. He invited anybody from the uh, Bush White House or the Bush administration. He invited the authors of the Popular Mechanics book. Not a single person would take up the challenge to come and debate members of the 9-11 uh, Truth Movement. Tom Hartman had a radio show. He has been trying for three or four months now to find anyone <coughs> who represents the official story to debate me or anybody else uh, representing the 9-11 Truth Movement. Not a single person disdains for debate because that's the sign of an irrational conspiracy theory that you know you cannot defend. Uh, okay. But let's look at how the news media use this term. Jim Dwyer wrote a New York Times story entitled, Two U.S. Reports Seek to Counter Conspiracy Theories About 9-11. But a more accurate title would have been, Two U.S. Reports Say Government's Conspiracy Theory is Better Than Alternative Conspiracy Theory. <coughs> you see, a headline would never make it in the New York Times. Um, and it's not just the mainstream press, even the left press. Um, Colin Wall, senior editor of In These Times, um, wrote an essay in which he talked about the 9-11 Truth Movement. And he said, the 9-11 Truth Movement caught my attention when I saw Dr. David Gray Griffin speaking at the University of Wisconsin in Madison on C-SPAN earlier this year, 2004. Griffin is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Religion at the Claremont School of Theology in California. He has written several well-regarded books on religion and spirituality, and is considered one of the nation's foremost theologians. I am familiar with his work and regard him as a wise writer on the role of spirituality in society. So it was shocking to see him pushing a radical conspiracy theory about 9-11 on C-SPAN. What could have transformed this sober, reflective scholar into a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> It did not occur to him that I had been a conspiracy theorist all along. The first year and a half, I accepted the government's conspiracy theory. He would not have called me a conspiracy theory then. You only use conspiracy theory in a one-sided, negative way to mean someone who is uh, a little irrational. <laughs> they use much stronger terms. Coburn has called us the 9-11 conspiracy nuts. Now, why this double standard? What I'm suggesting tonight is that we can understand it. Because when they use conspiracy theory, they don't mean simply it's irrational and scientific, unscientific. They mean it challenges the basic American faith, the basic faith in American goodness. That's what they mean when they use conspiracy theory in a derogatory way. And once we understand that, then we at least understand uh, what's going on. President Bush, right after 9-11, speaking to the United Nations, warned the country against outrageous conspiracy theories <laughs> that shift the blame to the wrong people. Now, in philosophy of science, which I've done my work in, um, it's obvious what an outrageous theory would be. You know, theories are very good things. You have quantum theory, you have relativity theory. It's very respectable to have theories. And uh, you debate these theories. And some of them turn out to be right, and some of them turn out to be wrong. But it's just the base, you know, you do it in terms of uh, rational consistency and uh, fitting the uh, facts. Uh, so a good theory is a theory that is consistent with all the relevant evidence. A bad theory is a theory that is inconsistent with some of the relevant evidence. An outrageous theory would be one that is inconsistent with all the relevant evidence. 
So if we were looking in a philosophy of science context, it would be the official theory about 9-11 that is the outrageous conspiracy theory. But of course, we're not operating in a philosophy of science context. We're operating in the American political context, where the criteria for what is outrageous or not outrageous is simply, does it agree with the basic American faith that America is good and only does good except once in a while makes a mistake? However, if we were operating in a context in which Christian faith was the dominant faith, it'd be a very different situation. Why so? Well, Christian faith is most centrally faith in God as revealed in the biblical tradition, and we Christians say, supremely in Jesus of Nazareth. Faith is really fidelity to that God. The, the word faith in the New Testament, it would really be best translated justified, that that has turned out uh, to be the case. But can Christian faith be compatible with nationalistic faith, with American faith? There's a big problem here. Because part of Christian faith is the doctrine of sin, sometimes called original sin, sometimes called the one empirically grounded doctrine of the Christian faith. And this comes from Jesus himself, who says, why call me good? No one is good but God alone. What is this original sin? That it's a tendency that on the one hand we have human species have a unique capacity that we can transcend our selfishness and our own perspective and our own concern and see that other people are equal to us in the eyes of the Creator. And so we say uh, all people are children of God, so all people have an equal right to the world's resources. We say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not do unto others what you would find hateful to have done to yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Dalai Lama, combining Christianity and Buddhism, even goes a step further and says, I heard him say this, he says, you should be more concerned about others than you are yourself. There are so many more of them. <laughs> so we have this capacity. We don't blame our pets for being selfish, taking all the food, or doing this or that. They, we know they don't have the capacity to objectify and see, I'm just one among others. I shouldn't have any special privileges. But what do we do? We tend as human beings, rather than using it that way, to use our transcendent power to be even more self-centered and to demand more, far more, uh, than our fair share uh, from others. Insofar as we have the power to do so, we use our knowledge, our capacity, our transcendence to give an advantage to ourselves and those of our own kind, rather than treating all people as equal children of the universe. Lord Acton, of course, famously had this statement that should be plastered on every refrigerator in this country. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, why is that so important to us? Because if you read the history of the U.S. political and uh, military policy of this country, we have for a very long time been seeking absolute power. And a, doctrine came, a document came out just shortly before uh, the, the last administration, this administration got into power, written by the Project for the New American Century. And uh, it was really a document for, let's wrap this thing up, we're very close. The Soviet Empire has fallen. We had this dipolar world for so many decades, 
but now we have a unipolar world. Normally that would be a bad thing, but because we're the uni and we are good, it'll be good for the world that we have absolute control. And they actually use the term Pax Americana. Now the Romans also thought Pax Romana was a very good thing. But if you read your New Testament, read the last chapter, the last book of the New Testament, Romans is the demonic. Rome is the embodiment of Satan from the point of view of that book. And if you also read Jesus' own words, you get you see the same thing. Read Richard Horsley's book, uh, Jesus and Empire. So, uh, from a Christian point of view, uh, power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. We began as an anti-imperial religion. Jesus was preaching an anti-imperial gospel. He was crucified by the Roman Empire. Crucifixion is only a Roman means of execution. So we began as an anti-imperial religion. If 9-11 was carried out, as all the evidence suggests, for empire, then Christians above all should be anxious to expose the truth about 9-11. But unfortunately, Many Christians in America, their Christian faith does not predominate. It is subordinate to their American faith. And so, Christians have not been very supportive of the 9-11 Truth Movement thus far. I've never had a sermon, I've never had an invitation to preach in a church canceled because somebody didn't like my Christology. I have had invitations canceled because they knew I was going to speak on 9-11. These churches would not even allow the case to be presented to their parishioners to let the parishioners make up their own mind. Because this was heresy. Really serious heresy. Um, now I've been supported by many very good, important theologians. John Cobb, Rosemary Ruther, Joe Hobb, president of the Union Theological Seminary and the late, great uh, William Sloan Cobb. But from several other theologians, uh, I have been attached. Ian Marker, the dean of Hartford Seminary, um, wrote a scathing critique in which he said this book was irresponsible. He said, first of all, conspiracy theories are inherently unworthy of belief, simply ignoring the fact theory, which he believed was a conspiracy theory. He said conspiracy theories are always based on a biased antagonism. Well, certainly all conspiracy theories are based on a bias, but it's not necessarily antagonism. He was saying, I'm saying this because I'm antagonistic to America. He didn't realize that the, uh, the more serious problem is our unquestioning, uncritical faith in our country can be used to support an untruthful uh, conspiracy theory. With regard to my argument about 9-11, he says, there need to be limits to the range of possibilities that are considered. And I want to suggest that Griffin is outside that. So it's not even permissible to consider the fact that 9-11 might have been an inside job. And here's the crucial passage. When a book argues that the American president, president deliberately and knowingly was involved in the slaughter of 3,000 U.S. citizens, then this is irresponsible. So I wrote to uh, Mark, and I said, uh, <clears throat> seems to me that our difference on 9-11 has primarily to do with an a priori assumption as to what the U.S. government and the Bush administration and, and its Pentagon in particular would and would not do. Markham said, yes, I am operating with an offerary assumption that Bush would not kill 3,000 citizens for the sake of a political justification to invade the Middle East for a while. <laughs> what about the Christian century? Long uh, journal for a liberal so 
socially concerned form of Christian faith. Well, the editor did a very unusual thing. Rather than assigning my book to be reviewed by somebody who might have said something good about it, he assigned himself the task of writing the review. And uh, you can guess the title of 9-11 Conspiracy Theory. And he said, Griffin and Merrick Professor, well known in the academy for works on religious pluralism and prophet's theology, has drunk deeply from the murky well of the 9-11 truth forums on the internet. Christian Faith and Truth Behind 9-11 is his third book on the subject, but the first with an imprint of a mainstream, make that mainstream Presbyterian publisher, which suggests that his loopy argument is making headway. This is a book review. He says, he notes that, uh, well, let me, the time is getting short. Let me uh, uh, skip that and just go to uh, uh, what he says near the end. First, he goes through and refutes my arguments by citing the official reports. <laughs> so the 9-11 Commission was run by Philip Zelikow, who was essentially a member of the Bush administration. He and Condoleezza Rice had worked together for many years. He and she wrote a book together when she was ready to put out a national security strategy for the United States of America. She brought in him to write it. And this is probably the most bellicose document ever produced by the United States government, which argued that because of 9-11, we've got to give up the old idea of a preemptive, a preemptive war where you cannot attack another nation unless you have certain evidence that they, that an imminent attack from them is coming, too imminent to take to the UN Security Council. So we can no longer afford that. We now must be uh, proactive and attack nations before they're ready to attack us. This person then was put in charge of the 9-11 Commission, which was supposedly supposed to ask, among other things, might the Bush administration have arranged 9-11 for political uh, purposes. Um, then he quotes uh, the, the NIST report to refute what I say about the World Trade Center, ignoring the fact that NIST is uh, a division, an agency of the Commerce Department and therefore of the Bush-Cheney administration. He treats all these as if they're neutral scientific bodies, not political uh, organizations. Again, part of this American faith it's a circular argument. He says, he, he starts out with the assumption, well, I know it wasn't an inside job, so of course they don't have anything to hide. So of course these reports are not a cover-up. So we can take them at uh, face value. He ends the book by saying, uh, Griffin's book is controlled by the conviction that neoconservatives are engaged in a demonic effort to build a global empire and will stop at nothing. The war on terror has been evoked to sponsor a foolish military adventure. Notice this, foolish, not immoral, not illegal, just foolish. The disastrous overreach in Iraq was fueled by imperialist delusions about making the Middle East, not greed for oil or anything like that, just imperialist delusions about turning it into a democracy. But tying that critique of U.S. policy to an outlandish theory about U.S. complicity in 9-11 can only invite ridicule. He ends by saying, the question arises, why did a Presbyterian publishing house sign up this corrosive and monomaniacal book? Well, what about the publishing, Presbyterian publishing company? Uh, they got a lot flack from many conservative Presbyterians about publishing the book. Here is one example. Uh, John Adams, the editor of the Presbyterian Layman, wrote that the layman feels that this book is, that, that it is not the Presbyterian Church's place to publish a conspiracy theory, and that for Westminster John Knox to do so, is tantamount to saying that the denomination agrees with Griffin. Describe
got in the book's argument of a harebrained idea, Adams criticized the press for moving into the full category of theology by publishing this book. In the course of the interview, he admitted he had never read the book. <laughs> you see again my point. We know all a priori that a book like this is wrong. You don't have to look at any of the evidence. So how did the Presbyterian Publishing Corporation respond? They first put out a uh, statement uh, supporting the book, saying that uh, one of our main tasks as theologians is to deal with current events in light of the fact that our first allegiance must be to God, who created and loves all people, indeed all forms of life. Uh, so he, they're, they're quoting me there. And uh, uh, they, they, they endorsed my statement. If we believe that our political and military leaders are acting on the basis of policies that are diametrically opposed to divine purposes, it is incumbent upon us to say so. End of my quote. At Westminster John Knox, we share Griffin's primary allegiance and seek to encourage sustained, informed, and respectful dialogue about the most pressing issues of our time. Professor Griffin's thorough research and intellectually vigorous arguments have persuaded us that this book should have a place in that conversation. Now, after the Presbyterian uh, the press, uh, board of directors got more and more flack, um, we got a statement evidently unprecedented in publishing history where a board came out and criticized in public a book that it had uh, published. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> chairman of the board, Kenneth Godshaw, said, now notice, no criticism of my theology. Griffin's theological reflections are helpful and timely. <laughs> the board believes that conspiracy, conspiracy theory is spurious, is spurious and based on questionable research. Now by the time I published that book, I have been working full time on 9-11 for almost three years. I had probably spent about 80 hours every week of those three years working on this story. I doubt that if any member of that board had spent one one thousand or one ten thousandth that much time, and yet they would state in public that my work was based on questionable research. Now, I made that statement to a reporter uh, who called from the Louisville Courier, um, and uh, that was read to Godshell. And uh, Godshell said, well, our problem is that Griffin failed to take into account rebuttals such as one published by popular mechanics. Well, that is simply flat out false. In that very book, I said that popular mechanics in his treatment of the towers and building seven ignored the suddenness, verticality, rapidity, and totality of the collapses, as well as failing to mention the testimonies about molten steel, demolition rings, and sounds of explosions. In other words, they had ignored seven of the most crucial kinds of evidence. And I went on to say, this was a spectacularly bad article. Here we were talking about a uh, public mechanics article that came out in 2005, which then later they expanded into a book in 2006. And I pointed out some of the absurd, other absurd claims of the book. Then I referred readers to two critiques of the book. And I said that they, the book had been thoroughly debunked by these critiques. Furthermore, if Godshell had asked me, I could have told him at the time that I was currently writing a book called Debunking 9-11, An Answer to Popular Mechanics and Other Defenders of the Official Conspiracy Theory. But of course, he didn't ask. So, what did Godshell do then? Well, after stating in that interview in the uh, Courier that no one would be disciplined for approving the book, I learned a couple months ago that Jack Keller, the vice president for publication 
and Grove and Westminster John Knox, who has done a fabulous job there, was fired. What is my hope? My hope is that Christians will put their loyalty to their God, who is true, ahead of any idolatrous loyalty. And that Christians will join with members of the other Abrahamic traditions who also worship the God of truth to demand that the truth about 9-11 be exposed. Thank you very much for your kind attention.